we have explored a few domains of mathematics on this channel, and we're now ready to bring them together into a bigger picture. We will see how every finite group can easily be represented by a group of matrices. But first, to warm up a little bit, I want to show you how this works for complex numbers. The complex numbers are built on top of the imaginary unit i, which is defined as a number that squares to negative 1. Geometrically, you should think of i as a 90 degree rotation. Start at 1 and rotate over 90 degrees. You end up here, which is why i is typically placed vertically above 0. Rotate by 90 degrees a second time and you get a total of 180 degrees, which corresponds to minus 1. This gives you a nice geometric interpretation for how something can square to negative 1. Since i is a rotation in the two-dimensional plane, it makes a lot of sense to represent it with a 2x2 two two rotation matrix. To construct this matrix, we use the build your own matrix trick that has helped us so many times in earlier videos. You just rotate the two basis vectors and see where they end up. The first one gets rotated to 0, 1, and the second one to minus 1, 0. This gives us the columns of our matrix. So this is what the imaginary unit i looks like as a 2x2 two two matrix. Let's call it R90. By the way, you would get the same result if you started from a generic rotation matrix and then filled in theta equals 90 degrees, or pi over 2. Let's check a couple of things. When you square this matrix, you get something that looks a lot like negative 1. So even in matrix form, i still squares to minus 1. Good. To obtain the other powers of i, we just raise r90 to those powers. As you can verify yourself, the fourth power is the identity matrix, which represents the fact that i to the fourth equals 1. The four powers of i are located on the corners of a square on the unit circle. They form a group under complex multiplication. We already talked about it earlier. It's isomorphic to a different group, the rotations of the square itself, which fall back to zero every time you rotate a full turn. It's also isomorphic to addition modulo 4, because when you rotate, you just add the angles and after four steps you fall back to zero. We have now discovered yet another group that is isomorphic to the other ones. It's a group of four matrices, with matrix multiplication as the binary operation. The key observation here is that the mappings between all of these groups are morphisms. So we have a morphism from the integer powers of i to a matrix group. Every relation between two powers of i gets mapped to the same relation between the matrices. A morphism from any given group to a group of matrices is called a matrix representation. It creates a bridge between group theory and linear algebra. So what we have here, specifically, is a matrix representation of the integer powers of i. Ok, what's next? How about this complex number eta over here? It's one of the square roots of i because it squares to i. So to turn it into a matrix, it would seem that we have to take the square root of a 2x2 two two matrix. How can we do that? One approach might be to start from an unknown matrix, square it, and then demand that it equals i. This will give us four equations which we could solve for the four unknowns. But unfortunately the equations are non-linear, and the algebra doesn't give us any useful intuition about the problem. Instead we should return to geometry. Our complex number lies on the unit circle, and has an angle of 45 degrees. So let's take a generic rotation matrix, and fill in theta equals 45 degrees or pi over 4. The result looks like this. When you multiply this matrix with itself, 
sure enough, you get i. Cool, so this is the square root of i that we were looking for. Of course, you can also construct it by following the basis vectors and then ploinking their coordinates into the columns of a matrix. The result is the same. It may seem weird that you can successfully take the square root of a matrix. But think about it. The square root of x is just a number that squares to x. Here we have one matrix that squares to another. It's the same thing. Eta is an eighth root of unity. When you raise it to the eighth power, you get one. The matrix representation is a morphism, so it maps this equation over to the world of matrices. It becomes exactly the same equation over there. You can verify that when you raise the matrix we found to the eighth power, yep, that's right, you end up at the identity matrix. When you take all of the eighth roots of unity together, they form a cyclic group. Eta serves as a generator for that group, because its integer powers produce all the other group elements. And once again, the morphism makes sure that the same thing happens in matrix land. So we have not only discovered a new cyclic group of eight rotation matrices, we have also found a generator whose powers produce all the other matrices in the group. And we have figured out that we can take square roots and other rational powers of these matrices, which is a really useful trick. By taking third and fourth and fifth roots of unity, we can reach all rational angles on the unit circle. After that, we can fill in the gaps with arbitrary rotation matrices over any angle theta, including when theta is a non-rational real number. This group is no longer discrete, it's continuous. It has infinitely many rotation matrices, and they get infinitely close to each other on a continuous shape, the unit circle. This group of all 2D rotation matrices is called SO2. We already looked at it in an earlier video. Now, the complex numbers on this unit circle are also a group. It's called U1. So, SO2 is the matrix representation for U1. I want to point out that you can think of these matrices as the real powers of R90. We started from the four integer powers of I, then we added square roots and other rational powers, and now we have arbitrary real numbers in the exponent. This is reasonable for complex numbers because those are numbers and we're used to raising numbers to any power we like. But to me it always feels a little weird to raise matrices to real powers. Just try to picture this as a number samba, and you'll see that it fails. This is one of the benefits of matrix representations. They allow us to carry ideas from number systems and other groups into the world of matrices and linear algebra. Okay, cool, but the circle doesn't cover the entire complex plane yet. We want to represent all complex numbers as matrices. That's actually pretty easy. Once you have the number i, all other complex numbers can be written as a kind of linear combinations of 1 and i. So let's just make linear combinations of these two matrices. We use the identity matrix for the real part, because it represents the real number 1. And we use R90 for the imaginary part, because it represents the imaginary unit i. Then we add everything up using matrix addition. And here's our final representation for all complex numbers. Is this still a group under multiplication? It actually is, but only if you first remove the number 0. 0 doesn't have an inverse under multiplication, so it can't be part of a group. So you have to punch a little hole in the middle of the complex plane, and now you have a group. The matrix representation contains all matrices of this specific form for any pair of numbers a and b that aren't both 0. 
these matrices always have a non-zero determinant, so they are always invertible. That's because they are perfect representations of the non-zero complex numbers, which are also invertible. The morphism makes sure that those kinds of properties are perfectly maintained. Remember that matrix multiplication isn't commutative in general, but complex multiplication is. Thanks to the morphism, this group of matrices inherits or copies commutativity from the complex numbers. You can verify that explicitly if you enjoy practicing your number samba. So this is a commutative subgroup of the much bigger non-commutative group GL2, the group of all invertible 2x2 two two matrices. What do the real numbers look like in this representation? Easy. Simply set the imaginary part in the linear combination to zero. We end up with a diagonal matrix, with two identical real numbers on the diagonal. You could probably see that coming, because diagonal matrices have the effect of stretching everything away from the origin. And that's exactly what real multiplication does to complex numbers as well. Alternatively, you can think of these diagonal matrices as the scalar multiples of the identity matrix, which represents the real number 1. Everything clicks together in a very satisfying way. We've been talking about rotations a lot, but what about reflections? Well, if you look at the effect of a complex multiplication, you will notice that it can do only two things. It can rotate, and it can stretch or shrink. It never flips the complex plane. So you simply cannot do any kind of reflection with a pure complex multiplication. One way to verify this is by calculating the determinant of an arbitrary matrix in our representation. It's cool to see how the single minus sign at the top right of the matrix cancels nicely against the subtraction in the definition of the determinant. The result is a sum of two real squares, which is always positive. This tells you that a complex number can never change the orientation of the plane, because that would require a negative determinant. Reflections are related to complex conjugation. You take a complex number and you flip the sign of its imaginary part. Geometrically, this behaves like a reflection over the real axis. Since it flips the orientation, it can never be accomplished purely with complex multiplications. So our matrix group cannot perform conjugation either. What is interesting though is that when you take the conjugate of a complex number, you get the transpose of the corresponding matrix. I don't know if this has an important underlying geometric reason, it's just a nice connection that I wanted to mention here. In the next video, we will represent reflections and other kinds of symmetries and group elements more generally. You can already watch that video on Patreon. Thanks for supporting us so that we can keep making these videos. Please also subscribe to the channel and give the video a thumbs up. Each complex number has two parts, real and imaginary. That makes the complex numbers a two-dimensional number system. When represented as 2x2 two two matrices, we now have four values in our matrix. But of course, these two are the same. And these two are always each other's opposite. That places two constraints on those four numbers, which leaves us with only two independent values A and B. That's a relief. It means that this group of matrices is still two-dimensional, just like the complex numbers themselves. Remember that the word dimension means degree of freedom. There are only two numbers we can freely choose here. The other two are then fixed. This brings us to an interesting question. Can we represent the complex numbers as 3x3 three three or 4x4 four four or even bigger matrices? The answer is yes. You can go as high as you want. Here is a very simple way to do it. You simply take one of our 2x2 two two matrices and embed it as a little block inside a bigger matrix. 
fill in the rest of the diagonal with ones. When you do the number samba, you will notice that the blocks at the top left still behave exactly like the original 2x2 matrices. Due to the zeros to the right and below, the calculations stay neatly localized inside the block. Nothing leaks in or out from the rest of the matrix. This is a very general purpose trick for embedding matrices inside larger ones. There are only two independent values that we can freely choose here, so even these much bigger matrices are still only two-dimensional. Ok, what about smaller matrices? Can we somehow represent the complex numbers as one-by-one one matrices? At first blush, this seems impossible, because we have only a single number this time. So we can make these matrices only one-dimensional, not two-dimensional. Well, we could of course cheat. Instead of matrices with real entries, we could allow matrices with complex entries. In that case it's very easy. Just take a complex number and put square brackets around it. This is a very sneaky one by one complex representation for the complex numbers. I hope you agree that it isn't very interesting. It doesn't really add anything new. Note that we have only a single number, but it has a real and imaginary part inside. So it's really still two dimensional. If we limit ourselves to real numbers, we are stuck. We can never faithfully represent all complex numbers as one by one real matrices. But this doesn't mean that the story ends here. We can still find interesting homomorphisms from the complex numbers to the one by one real matrices. One example is the modulus representation. You put the modulus or norm or length of the complex number by itself between square brackets. Since the norm of a product is the product of the norms, the norm is a homomorphism, so it satisfies the definition of a representation. The downside is that infinitely many complex numbers have the same norm, so the mapping is no longer an isomorphism. But that's okay. A representation only has to be a homomorphism. Even though we don't capture all the details with such a lower dimensional representation, we still capture some details, and this can still be useful in various contexts. This is a good opportunity to mention the trivial representation. You see, you can always be lazy and just map every complex number to the identity matrix. This mapping satisfies the definition of a homomorphism because the product of two numbers is mapped to the correct product between two identity matrices. It should be obvious that this is not an isomorphism. Many complex numbers, in fact all of them, get mapped to one and the same target matrix. Since the only matrix in this representation contains constant numbers instead of variables, there is no degree of freedom. So this group with only a single matrix is zero-dimensional. The trivial representation is defined as the one that maps every group element to the number one, or more accurately to the little one-by-one one identity matrix. Even though this representation is extremely simple, it still plays an important role in the study of matrix representations, as we will see in upcoming videos. We will look at many more representations for other groups as well. Please subscribe, like, shout it from the rooftops and support us on Patreon if you can spare a few bucks. Thank you and see you next time.